We're going to come back together here. If you have your Bibles or electronic device, you can open to the, the Gospel of Luke, the 15th chapter. Luke chapter 15. But even as you're turning there, I want to maybe paint a picture for you. Not a picture of what's happening in Luke chapter 18. Um, or 18, I said. <laughs> I am tired. I'm sorry if I stumble over my words today. Luke chapter 15 is where you're turning. I want to paint a picture, but not necessarily the picture of Luke 15. Um, but more uh, the picture of what Christ was trying to convey uh, to his disciples, what Christ was trying to convey uh, to the church, what Christ was trying to convey to you and I uh, 2,000 years later. Um, and there is this idea that Jesus was working towards. And this picture is something that we're going to be focusing in on today and utilizing the scripture in Luke chapter 15. Uh, so that picture, to take you there, isn't a picture with my description. It's not a picture picture on the screen. It is um, something that I would like us to look at what God has to say uh, about what his picture would look like for the church. And so in Acts chapter 9, I'm going to read you one verse just for a minute that I think many times we glance over. In the story of the Acts of the Apostles, we move from event to event. And it almost seems like this one verse that we're going to look, like, or look at is a hinge verse on ending this event and moving towards that next event. However, it is not. Uh, what this verse actually is, is it is this moment of definition of what the church should look like. It is that oh, moment when Luke, writing the book of Acts, says, wow, the church is doing what it's supposed to be doing. And what does that look like? That's what I want to zero in on for a moment and take a peek at. In Acts chapter 9 and verse 31, that one verse that I just um, did all of that introduction for, just simply says this. Then the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace. It was strengthened and encouraged by the Holy Spirit. It grew in numbers, living in the fear of the Lord. Now just pause for a minute. Let's unpackage that picture for just a moment. What we see in Acts chapter 9 verse 31 is the picture of what the church should be functioning at. When it's firing on all cylinders, this is how the church looks. This is how the church uh, is doing things right. It is a church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria, meaning it is a church of multicultural, multi-ethnic, multi-belief system background, multi-sin that you've been redeemed from background, multi-generational, multi-everything church. It is a church for all people, is what that is telling us. Second, we see in that one verse, not only is it this church in Judea, Galilee, and Samaria, um, but there is this time of peace. Now, here's the thing. We hear that word peace, especially in Scripture, and we think, oh, good, they weren't at war. No, that's not what it means. It means the church itself was at peace within the church. They weren't inwardly bickering. There was unity. There was oneness. There was peace. When the church is firing on all cylinders, we're reaching all people. We are at peace within the church. It was strengthened. That word indicates that the church members themselves were growing. That they weren't stagnant, but they were being strengthened in their faith and in their relationship. They are encouraged by the Holy Spirit. They are seeing Holy Spirit do amazing things in the world around them. And that encouraged them to be bold for God and to do new and great things. And, oh, by the way, it grew in numbers. In our culture today, that's how we define the success of a church. Are they growing in numbers but here's the thing, it needs to reach all of those other parameters first. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm a pastor. I would love for churches to be growing in numbers. Numbers are a good thing. It's our measurable, whether that's financial numbers of the church or body count numbers as a church or salvation numbers as a church, absolutely. But it came well down in the list well down in the list because all of these other pieces have to be in place in order for the church to truly be growing in numbers. 
And then it closes it up and says, living in the fear or respect of who God is. In the fear of the Lord. This is the picture I want us to focus in on for a minute. We have a lot to talk about today uh, as we talk about the status of the church, if you will. More specifically, I'm not talking about the status of Cornerstone. I'm not talking about the status of our building or our budget or anything of that nature. So don't worry, it's not a business meeting. I'm talking about the status of the church that means you. The status of the church that means your sphere of influence. And those like-minded believers that you rub shoulders with. And the status of the church as you rub shoulders with non-like-minded believers. Or non-like-minded people, I should say. And, and what does it look like when the church is firing on all of its cylinders? How does it look when God is doing a great and amazing work? See, today we're talking about mission. And again, this isn't a business meeting. I'm not talking about a mission statement. Uh, mission statements are great. But I want to talk about the mission. The mission of the church. I have stated over and over and over again my personal philosophy in the church, uh, in ministry, what God has called me to be a part of in the church and to uh, lead in the direction of, and it, I have adopted it as on a, every single one of our board meeting agendas. Karen can testify to that as a board member sitting up front here. And it says at the very bottom of, of all of them, it was in our bulletin when we did hand bulletins, it says very simply this, the church does not exist to entertain the already saved. But rather, the church exists because we want to grow disciples. That's the strengthened part. We want to reach the lost. And we want to worship and live in fear of the Lord. We want to honor and respect who Christ is. We want to worship. That is the purpose of the church. But too many times, we make it about being entertained. We make it about being uh, comfortable. We make it about feeling uh, like we are accomplishing something within our, our own unit uh, uh, of our family or our, or our church building itself or something of that nature. But the mission has never been that. In Luke chapter uh, 19, Jesus gave his mission to those that were gathered there in that place, in that situation. And he very simply says in verse 10, he says, the Son of Man came. Are you ready for it? Here's his mission. The Son of Man, meaning Christ, came to seek and to save that which was lost. Period. That is the mission that Christ was after. And so the question is, are we doing that? Are we living up to that as a church? How are we falling in line with what God has to say about the mission of the church? How are we living out our faith, not just on a Sunday morning as we gather together or on a small group Wednesday or Thursday or Tuesday or Monday or whatever day, not just in those moments when it's easy to act like a Christian, but how are we living out our faith with people who oppose us? How are we living out our faith with people who look different than us? How are we living out our faith with those who just simply don't know our story and God's story and what he wants to do in their life? How are we living out being the church? In Luke chapter 15, beginning in verse 1, we, we unpackage three stories that Jesus tells. He starts, and what well, you call them parables, uh, they are stories that have a message behind them. And he starts out, in verse 1, and he tells this story, and we're going to read this one, and it's seven verses long, and it's about sheep, and one being lost, and 99 being in the flock. Many of you have heard the story before, and he tells this story of what the shepherd does in that situation. He follows that up with another story about a woman who loses some money. She has 10 coins, she loses one. Now, in our culture today, we think of coins as valueless because they're just change in our pocket and they only, you know, the biggest coin we carry in our pocket today is a quarter and it doesn't get us very much. But in biblical time, it was the currency. It would be like more like losing a Benjamin Franklin from your pocket instead. And she had 10 of them, but she lost one. She turned her house upside down looking for that one. And wouldn't you, if you lost a $100 bill, you would... Move some furniture to find it, right? You would figure out where it snuck out of your hands and fell to. And then he follows it up with another story about a man who has two sons. And the one son, we call it the story of the prodigal. 
he demands his inheritance. He goes and he squanders it in, in living the way that he wants to, and then he comes home. And the, the first brother who didn't do all of that, he is upset. He's not happy because this brother of his has squandered all of this stuff, and his dad accepts him back as if it is no problem. I bring all of that to you just simply to say this. We are about to start into verse 1 and moving forward on a series of teaching by Jesus where he is reiterating his mission. In each of those stories, the God figure, the shepherd, the woman looking for the coin, or the father waiting for his son to return. In each of those stories, the God figure does anything they can to restore to save, to heal, to find. And yet, I would argue that many times we as a church, we're not doing everything we can to find, to heal, to restore. We sit on the porch waiting for that person to come back repentant of their sin instead of just dropping everything and running to them. We discount the value of the coin that is lost because we still have nine in our pocket. We don't care about the one sheep because there's still 99 left in the fold. And we lose focus of what God's mission is. So in Luke chapter 15, we find in verse 1 the beginning of those stories. It reads like this. It says, Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teacher of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners, and he even eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. And then he calls his friends and his neighbors together. And he says, rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. And then Jesus gives some application. He says in verse 7, I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over the 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Father God, I just come to you right now. I lift these words that you have spoken to us your written word, and I pray, God, that you would open it to our minds, to our hearts. Help us to infiltrate it into our very core of our lives and our very being. God, that these would not be words that we hear and then just forget about them, but God, help us to apply these words to our heart. Help us to seek what you would have for us this morning and to learn your truth and to be transformed by it. Help us to see the world as you see the world, not through the eyes that we so easily see it on our own. Help us to see people as you see them in desperate need of love, in desperate need of forgiveness, in desperate need of being found and returned. So God, help us to seek your truth, your kingdom, your righteousness. God, not my words. I don't want my words to be heard at all. That has to be you, God. It has to be you. And so, God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable and pleasing in your sight, O oh God. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' holy name. Amen. Cornerstone Church is a church that is a Wesleyan church. We are part of a denomination, and we don't push the Wesleyan church too much by any means. Uh, it is just the organization that we believe in. It is where we have aligned ourselves with other like-minded believers that believe the same about many core issues. But the Wesleyan church gains its name from a man back in the 1700s named John Wesley. And it's actually after two men, John and Charles Wesley. They were brothers. And uh, they were pretty extraordinary people. If you study history and, and church history specifically, uh, it will blow your mind kind of some of the things that they did to just crash uh, the world around them and change how the church did what they did. And out of that came not just one, it was one at that time, but many denominations over the years. And John Wesley, he was the preacher of the two. Charles was the musician. Charles wrote over 5,000 hymns, by the way. 
in a time when hymns were the way the church worked. And in his hymns, he always incorporated scripture, and he utilized every single book of the Bible when he wrote those hymns. Every single book of the Bible is, is, is quoted at some point in one of his hymns, which is amazing. But John, he was the preacher, and so he decided that he wasn't comfortable enough to just stay in the church and wait for people to come to him to hear the message of Christ and who he was. Instead, he went to the foundries where people were working, and he met with them on their lunch hour, and he would preach. He went to the coal mines, and he met with people, and he would preach the gospel. He spent days on end on horseback traveling all around England sharing the gospel. And he was confronted over it numerous times. He was confronted by his denominational leaders who weren't happy that he was going to these irreparable places. You see, he and his brother would stand outside the bars and talk to those going in and talk to those coming out. Matter of fact, many of Charles Wesley's hymns are sung to what then were bar tunes. And so the church didn't like how they were doing it, and they confronted him. John Wesley, in response to that, he said this quote. He says, we have nothing to do, he's referring to the church, we have nothing to do but the mission of saving souls. We lose that focus. We lose that focus so many times, we forget what our mission is. We lose the, the, the narrow uh, focus of what God wants us to do when we broaden it out to trying to make people feel comfortable or entertained, and we forget the focus of what God is wanting to do uh, in the lives of people around us, and we wait for someone else to do it because I'm not comfortable stepping out on that uh, that a planet to, uh, of, of existence. I am not comfortable going and stepping out of the boat and walking on the water. Jesus, I can't do that. And so we stay in the boat and wait for Peter to jump out. And, and we get comfortable being entertained. We get comfortable uh, sitting and doing the things that we get in the ritual of doing and we lose focus of what the purpose of the church is. The reason Jesus came into the world, remember in, Je in Luke chapter 19, verse 10, was to seek and to save the lost. That was his mission. What is our mission? A few years ago, there was a movie made. I honestly cannot tell you that I've seen the movie. I have not watched the entire movie in any way, shape, or form. But it's a movie about the World Trade Center, 9-11 uh, in 2002, uh, that fateful day. Sorry, 2001. Said the wrong date. That fateful day, there's this movie that's been made about it. I want to pause this for just a minute. And we're going to watch about a two minute clip from that movie. And just hang in there for a minute, and you'll find purpose here in just a moment. Go ahead.
You are our mission. That Marine was not there to fight a war. That Marine was not there uh, for battle or any of the things that he had been officially trained for. That Marine was there with the mission of saving people. Right? And when he found and encountered the one who was pinned, that one was fearful that he would be left alone once again and the statement, you are our mission. Now, if you remember anything about 9-11, you understand that those who responded were also in harm's way. Buildings weren't stable around them. There was no guarantee that they were fine, but they were focused on the mission. This morning, I just want to get us on focus for what the church's mission is. What is our mission? What is our mission? The mission is to reach the lost. Our mission is to go after the one. Our mission is to seek and to save as Jesus enables us to do so. Our mission is to leave the flock. Our mission is to upturn the furniture and look for that coin. Our mission is to go all in. And even as I say that, I don't think that the church would argue against me. Most people in the church are sitting there going, okay, we get it. We're to reach the lost. I'm on board with that. Sure, that's fine. What does that look like? How do I do it? And I can, you know, it, you don't really mean me actually like talking to people, right? And here's the thing. God calls us each to different things. And so I can't tell you exactly how God has gifted you and equipped you for what purpose, for what timing and all of that sort of thing. But when we are laser focused in on the mission of who God is and the need around us to seek, and the need around us to dig in and, and to, to find those who are lost and to help, then God opens those doors and reveals the when. He reveals the what. So I just want to talk for a moment about the how, as he also reveals that in a scripture here. We started with verse 1, the story of the lost sheep. And so... How do we reach the world around us? How do we live out the mission that God has called us to to reach other people? Uh, isn't that what we pay you for, Pastor Stephen? You're the professional in the church. You're to reach the lost. Absolutely I am, but so are you. Matter of fact, my job, according to the Scripture, is not to reach the lost as much as it is to equip you guys to do that very thing, as told in Ephesians chapter 5, if you don't believe me. And so understand, sorry, Ephesians chapter 4, if you do, if, if, if understand that God is calling us as a unit to reach the world. He's calling us as a unit to show love and grace. He's calling us as individuals and as a cohesive unit to do the thing that he himself wants to do. Why? So that we can live out that picture that I started this all out with in Acts chapter 9 of the church living in this great place of awesomeness where God was working in powerful ways. Lives were being transformed. In Judea, Galilee, Samaria, there is this time of peace. There is this strengthening of the believers. There is this encouragement of what the Holy Spirit is doing and by the Holy Spirit in our lives. There is this growth in numbers as we're seeing people come to Christ and seeing God do moving, uh, do things and moving in unique ways. And there is this living in respect and fear of the Lord so that we are in relationship with Him as God and not uh, putting ourselves in that place as God's. And so as we do all of that, we come to that question of how do we accomplish it? How do we live it out? And so I want to point out the first thing is we need to be willing to leave the 99. You see, here's the thing. Many times we can look at this story and we can say, what in the world's going on? This shepherd, he's got 100 sheep, one runs off. Okay, we get it. That sheep's important. But so are the 99, right? And he leaves them to go after the one. Who's taking care of the 99 while he's going after the one? Now here's the, we're not going to get into a lot of uh, story about how, you know, shepherding works and all of that, but it does tell us that the 99 are cared for, okay? Not by people. They're left in open country where they're safe, and he goes after the one. But if we as the church want to accomplish the mission that God has called us to, we need to be willing to leave the 99, We need to be willing to go where God calls us to go. We need to be willing to say what God wants us to say. We need to be willing to do what God wants us to do. We need to be willing to leave the 99. Jesus is telling these people around him this in this parable. 
But even before he unpackages the parable of the 99 and the 1, he's already showing that he is leaving the 99. See, Jesus, he could have stayed in heaven where he was the King of kings and the Lord of lords sitting on a throne and angels worshiping him and all of this sort of thing. He could have stayed there. But he came, he left the 99 to come into the world to seek the lost. And not only uh, once he got here, he could have hung out with the church people. He could have been with the crowd that was great and good and reputable and that sort of thing. But instead, he chose to hang out with, how does it say it? Oh, wait, tax collectors and sinners that have gathered around him. And the church people, they don't like it because that's not comfortable. Jesus was willing to leave the 99. What were the 99 thinking? How dare you bring that type of person back to this flock? They wandered off. They deserve to be where they're at, maybe. How can you leave us? How can you leave us and go after that? We need you here. There's a lot of things that could be thought or felt or wondered by the 99, but here's the thing. If we are following the example of the shepherd, we understand that that one that one desperately needs to be found. So how do we do it? We leave the 99. I'm not saying leave the church. I'm saying live in the world around you. Live your faith out loud to the world around you. Live the love of Christ in the world around you. Live the words that you believe in your heart. Live them through your mouth. Speak the word. Speak the truth. Speak grace. Speak love. Go and serve and care for those who can't Take care of themselves. Be the church. Leave the comfort of the fold. Leave the 99 and go and reach the world. John Wesley, I quoted him earlier. I'm going to quote him once again because he said this. He said that if you light yourself on fire with passion, that people will come from miles to watch you burn. Basically what he was saying, people were asking him, how in the world are you reaching all of these people? How are people coming to Christ so much under your ministry? He just says, leave uh, this idea of comfort in the 99 and light yourself on fire with the passion of who God is and what God wants to do. Light yourself on fire with the passion of the Holy Spirit living in you. That's how you reach the world is when you are willing to leave the safe place. When you are willing to leave your comfort level, when you are uh, willing to allow God to take you to rough terrain to find the lost, when we light ourselves on fire with the passion of the Holy Spirit living in us and what he is doing, and we realize that people love to watch things burn. And when you have the passion of Christ, people love to see that. People love to see it. And people are drawn to the light of God in your life. We need to be willing to leave the 99. But not only that, in this this parable that Jesus is talking about, the first step in recovering the lost was to leave the 99. The second piece of that puzzle was he just didn't stop looking. He didn't wander away from the crowd just a little bit, the shepherd or the sheep just a little bit, look around and say, well, I, I tried, and then turn back. Matter of fact, Scripture tells us in this passage of Scripture that he he went after the lost sheep until he found it. Verse 4. Until he found it. There is this, it's almost like minorly written in here, but is this understanding that there was perseverance. That he didn't give up on the lost. He kept pursuing them. He kept running after them. And if that's not enough for you, you can look in the next two parables where the widow or the woman seeking the coin, she doesn't just say, well, I lost it. I looked around on the counter. It wasn't there. I'm good. She overturns the house. She goes and doesn't give up on it. Or if you look at the father in the story of the prodigal, he is just putting everything on pause, watching the road, waiting for the one to return. He is not giving up on the one. He may have heard the stories of how his son was living and the things he had gotten himself into. He was looking down the road. We need to understand that God has called us to reach the world around us that is lost, that needs to know his love, that needs to know his grace, and we can't give up on that mission. Uh, The Apostle Paul says it this way, do not grow weary 
in the ministry of doing good to others because we will reap a harvest. We need to remember that at times it is not easy. At times it's easier to give up and go back to the 99. It is easier to quit the search and to quit exposing ourselves to the needs of other people and to quit being vulnerable in our own story and to quit sharing uh, the things that God has done because it unpackages all of these things. But understand, God says, do not quit. Don't stop just because the task is hard. Don't stop just because it takes you away from comfort. Don't stop just because pursue those who are lost. Go the extra mile. Don't quit. And the next pieces that I find in this parable that are so interesting are what the shepherd does after he has found the one. He's found the one who is lost, but how does he bring that one back to the flock? He picks it up and he places it on his shoulder. Shepherds in biblical times, they, they carried a staff. We've seen it in you know, uh, the, the movies, Charlton Heston style, right? But this was an actual thing that they carried, and it was on purpose, and that staff was not a gentle instrument, by the way. We think, because we see the movies of them using it as a walking stick, which they probably did, but more to the point, haha, it was intended to bash in parts of the sheep to herd it in a certain direction. You would thunk it uh, to turn it and to prod it forward. You would poke it, and you would be not kind. And Sometimes, if the sheep was going the wrong way, you would even take the other end of the staff and you would hook it around its neck and yank it back to where it should be going. That is not gentle, okay? And that's how the shepherd could have acted with the one who was lost in Jesus' parable. I mean, after all, this one who was lost, I, if, if you've searched any amount of time for your keys, when you find them, maybe you feel relief, but maybe you just feel angry that you lost them in the first place, right? And this shepherd, he is looking for this one and he's just, the anger's building because he's walking in the heat of the day looking for the one. He is going over rocks and thistles and thorns. He is everywhere looking for this one and his day is not a good day. But rather than taking it out on the sheep, he lifts up the sheep and he carries the burden. When God calls us to reach the lost, he doesn't tell us to go out there and thump people over the head with our truth. He tells us to speak truth in love. When God calls us to go and to reach into the world, he asks us to carry their burden, to lift people up, to serve those around us because the first shall be last and the last shall be first. Jesus himself took on the, the form of a servant and washed feet and he said to his disciples, you need to do the same. We need to carry the burden of the people around us who don't know Christ and lift them up and carry them back to the flock. That's how people will come, is when we show them the love of the Good Shepherd. When we carry their burden, when we pick them up, and we take them back. And then, and then, after this moment of seeking and going and leaving the flock and, and the pursuit of, and this relentless pursuit after this one, and after the, the, the time of carrying the burdens of that one and, and lifting up their needs and taking care of them and all of these sorts of things, after they have finally come to the culmination, the returning moment, the shepherd rejoices. Matter of fact, he calls together all of his friends and says, I have found that which was lost. I have found my lost sheep. Verse 6. Or the woman who is looking for the coin, when she finds the coin, she turns to her friends and says, I found it. I found the money that I had been looking for for so long. And the father, when the prodigal returns, he throws a feast. He's so excited of the return of the lost. Church, we need to rejoice a little sometimes. We need to rejoice that God forgives, that God restores that God even entrusts us to be a part of the journey and to be a part of the, of the process of bringing others into relationship with him. We need to be willing to give praise where it is due that God has done great things and done great works in people's lives and that God has worked in and through you sometimes. We need to be willing to rejoice and be glad and to not grow weary of the good that we're doing to not grow weary of the time that we're donating, 
to not grow weary of the chore that seems to always be in front of us, to not grow weary of people always seeming to mess up in their sin, but to rejoice in the fact that Christ forgave them of their sin, to rejoice in the fact that this is someone who has finally come home. And the Scripture tells us, Jesus, he turns to those Pharisees who are confronting him about the sinners and tax collectors that he's hanging out with, and he says, there is more rejoicing in heaven over that one returned than in your righteousness. That word is there on purpose. I would almost say than your self-righteousness. Your staying comfortable. Your living up to your own standard rather than God's. So in that video clip, we saw the Marine looking. We saw the man suffering. We saw the man being found and the cry for help. And we heard the phrase, you are my mission. Who is your mission? Who is your mission? Who in your world is trapped under a load of sin? that God is putting in your foresight to say, I need to carry their burden. I need to leave my comfort. I need to leave the 99. I need to pursue this with all of who I am. And I will rejoice when God delivers and brings healing. Who is your mission? Is it a neighbor? Maybe. Is it a coworker? Maybe. Is it a family member? Maybe. Is it just that casual person you see at the bank every now and again? Maybe. I don't know who your mission is. If you don't know who your mission is, ask God to show you. He will. I promise you. If you ask in sincerity for God to open your eyes to the world that is hurting around you and to show you how you can love others, how you can seek after those who are lost, how you can carry their burden, He will show you. I promise you. And then, church, And then we go back to that picture of Acts chapter 9, verse 31, where the church starts to fire on all cylinders because we're rejoicing in what he's doing. We're carrying the burdens of other people. We're lifting other people up. We're not caught up in the comfort of church, but rather we're seeking the the unity of Christ in the church. We're reaching the lost no matter what they look like, no matter where they're from, no matter what the situation is. We're being strengthened as we grow in our faith because we are seeing God move. We are encouraged when the Holy Spirit moves around us. And oh, by the way, then we'll grow in numbers. Church, I want to encourage us to be on mission. I want to encourage us as individuals to be on mission. I want to encourage you to be on mission because Cornerstone can't be on mission until we are on mission. So Jesus, once again, I come to you and I thank you that I was once a lost sheep and you left the flock and you came after me and all of my pride and all of my arrogance and all of my everything, you came after me when I thought I could do it on my own. And God, I thank you that you you didn't thump me over the head with your staff of righteousness. God, you loved me with an unfailing love. And so God, now you tell me that I'm the shepherd, that I'm a shepherd, that I am to seek the lost. You tell me that there's a coin lost and I need to start looking for it. God, you tell me that my son is gone and I need to I need to rejoice when he comes back. I need to be the father in that situation. God, I need to have eyes to see the world around me in the way that you see the world around me. God, I need to have a heart to care and to love for other people the way that you care and love for other people. God, I need to be willing to carry the burden. I need to be willing to persist in seeking the lost. I need to be willing to rejoice in you and not in my own accomplishments. And God, even as I'm praying all of this, I just have that feeling that I'm not the only one who needs to say once again, create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. Teach me your ways, O God. And I know I'm not the only one that says this. So God, I throw it down at your throne because I know that when I lay it to you, you pick it up. 
and you begin the restoration process. You point me towards divine appointments. You give me the grace when I am all out of it. You give me the mercy when I have no more to give. And God, I ask this for my brothers and sisters in Christ as well, that we would serve our community, that we would not grow comfortable in the flock, but God, that we would be always seeking the one. And God, to you be all the glory. To you be all of the worship. Because that's where it's due. It's not in our good works that any one of us would boast. But God, it is your grace. It is your mercy. It is your love. And so we give you the thanks. We give you the praise. And it's in Jesus' holy name that we do pray.